Welcome to Chain of Learning, where the links of leadership and learning unite. I'm your host and fellow learning enthusiast, Katie Anderson, and I am so excited to welcome my guests, Steve Spear and Jean Kim, the co-authors of the new book, Wiring the Winning Organization, Liberating Our Collective Greatness Through Slowification, Simplification, and Amplification. Uh, and a little intro to our fabulous guests before we start, dive into what I know is going to be a fantastic conversation. Uh, Steve Spear is a renowned thought leader in the field of organizational excellence and high performance systems, an accomplished author, consultant, and senior lecturer at the MIT Sloan School of Management. Steve has dedicated his career to helping organizations achieve breakthrough results by implementing innovative management practices. Uh, Steve has been instrumental in shaping the way businesses approach problem solving, continuous improvement, and building resilient, adaptive organizations. And Steve has been instrumental in my own chain of learning by being an early influence in my understanding of the behaviors and systems behind Lean, the Toyota production system, and continu continuous improvement uh, when I was leading performance improvement in hospital systems in the early 2000s. Uh, and this included Steve's publication, including Decoding the DNA of the <laughs> Toyota Production System and Fixing Healthcare from the Inside Today, along with his great book, The High Velocity Edge. Uh, and Gene Kim is a Wall Street Journal bestselling author, researcher, um, and multiple award-winning CTO who has been study studying high-performance technology organizations since 1999. He is the founder and CTO, or was the founder and CTO of Tripwire for 13 years, and is a highly respected thought leader in technology and organizational transformation, and best known for his groundbreaking work in DevOps and IT management. And Gene and I initially got connected through another link in my chain of learning, John Willis, who is also an influential leader in the DevOps space, who came to Japan with me earlier this year on one of my Japan study trips. And uh, Gene and Steve are here to talk about their book, Wiring the Winning Organization, and I'm so excited to dive in. So welcome to Chain of Learning, Steve and Gene. Thanks for having us. Oh, yeah, you're so great to be here. So good to finally meet you and congratulations on your own book. <laughs> that was uh, yeah. so lovely. And all your interviews with uh, Mr. Yoshino, et cetera. So, so great to meet you. Thank you, Gene. And I'm, I'm thrilled to be joining the your ranks of you and Steve as a Shingo award-winning author as well <laughs> with my book, Learning to Lead, Leading to Learn, and how we all have sort of contributed to that, that greater chain of learning about what it really means to create these winning organizations, these high-performing learning organizations. Uh, so my first question to you actually is about how do you define a winning organization? Hey, Gene, you want to start with that? <clears throat> uh, yeah, you know, I'll start from the, the software side. Um, so um, one of the things I am so professionally proud to be associated with is a study called the State of DevOps Research. And so uh, similar to uh, uh, what the automotive folks did in the 1980s, where they mm -hmm. benchmarked you know, 40 plus plants around the globe, um, we did a cross-population study that spanned about 36,000 respondents uh, from 2013 to 2019. And so this was Dr. Nicole Forsgren and Jez Humble. And you know, our quest was to understand what does high performance look like? And uh, we found you know, the same sort of uh, agility and resiliency found in uh, manufacturing organizations where uh, uh, we measured it by the agility metrics of uh, you know, how quickly can they go from code being ready, um, you know, by, done by developers, and through testing, through integration, through uh, deployment, mm -hmm. so it's successfully running in production. Um, and they can do it more quickly, more frequently. And when something goes wrong, uh, they can repair those issues far more quickly. You know, and we found not a fourfold in, uh, difference in performance, but we found like a, uh, somewhere between two or three orders of magnitude difference wow. in performance. Yeah. So there's something about the, the uh, nature of software that allows for these even bigger differences um, between high and uh, low performers, or we call it high and not high performers. <laughs> but we also found that uh, in addition to those you know, technology measures, uh, these organizations were twice as likely to exceed profitability, market share, and productivity goals. Uh, uh, employees were twice as likely to recommend their organization as a great place mm. to work to their colleagues and friends. So that's the uh, employee net promoter score. Um, and so it really just says you know, when winning requires work in the technology value stream, then you know these practices and principles that we associate mm. with DevOps uh, you know, help with the achievement of those objectives. And I think this is one of the reasons why I was so excited to work with uh, Steve, who I met uh, almost 10 years ago, and it's been mm -hmm. one of the most rewarding journeys of my entire life. Me too. Yeah, so if I could uh, pick up on what Gene said. First, I just want to uh, really appreciate Gene's reference back to the motor vehicle program, which was housed at MIT in the uh, the 1980s. 
and that was uh, billed as the uh, the five year five million dollar study of the world auto industry, um, which revealed these enormous disparities between the very best in the field and everybody else. As Gene would say, you know, the, the best and not best. Um, <laughs> credit to Gene here is that you know this motor vehicle program was across multiple universities, lots of researchers, et cetera. Gene did this, you know, a handful of people and, and did an equally good, ambitious, comprehensive, rigorous study in a very different sector. Um, Katie, to your question about defining what does it mean for a winning organization, everything Gene was saying, and this was true everywhere else we look, is um, you have these enormous disparities in performance, whether it's uh, multiple differences in um, productivity orders of magnitude differences in quality, safety, security, et cetera, et cetera. And the key point is it's on a level playing field, is that when you do these comparisons, it's not as if it's, everyone is working in the same environment of looking at a market space for opportunities. And because they're looking in the same place, more or less through the same lens, they find similar opportunities. They're dependent on the same vendors for raw materials, capital equipment. They're operating within the same regulatory, legal, financial um, environment ecosystem. And the thing about level playing fields, everything equal like that, you would expect if everything is equal, so should be the outputs and the outcomes. And what was so striking to the folks who looked at the motor vehicle program and Gene with his colleagues looking at DevOps is that despite the level playing field nature of the um, competitive space, the differences in performance were extraordinary. And so this loops back to you know, this uh, whole learning dynamic that we all share great appreciation and affection for and enthusiasm about is that if um, all you have is differences in outcome because everything else is the same, the only thing left to explain the differences in outcome is the management systems and how people's time is shaped and crafted and formed and otherwise curated. And, uh, you know, as you men, I appreciate the mention you uh, gave to uh, several articles I re wrote across different sectors, healthcare, industry, et cetera. And um, what you tie that together with all the great research Gene has done, we see these huge disparities between great and not great everywhere. And that really <laughs> yeah. encourages us to start thinking about what's the nature of the management systems that can create these huge disparities everywhere. And just to call out to your book, uh, Katie, like what, I think one of, we have these kind of cross-population studies, uh, like what Steve uh, mentioned uh, and that I got to participate in. But we also have these longitudinal studies, like the Numi joint venture, right, where yep. uh, Mr. Yoshino tells so eloquently, right, everything was the same. <laughs> Equipment, yeah. workforce, the only thing that changed was the management system. And I think that was right. a thread that Steve and I uh, got so much glee and also uh, had so much exertion. You're really trying to understand what are these yeah. mechanisms of performance that span all industries, uh, different phases of value creation, uh, and, and ask what is in common between DevOps, mm. the Toyota production system, and the conclusion is, you know, they're all, uh, they're the same mechanism of performance. Right. Yeah. Right. And uh, if I'll just, uh, if I could just um, piggyback on something Gene just said about, if it was all about cross-sectional, then that's an interesting story. And if you're interested in such interesting stories, you can go there, but you can also read War and Peace or anything else. But the Gene's point is longitudinal. And that, that, that's not an interesting story. That's a useful story. Because if it's longitudinal, it means that if there's a, uh, a before condition, an intervention, a change in the management system and an after condition, then these uh, methods, me mechanisms, whatever it is, are available to everybody, which means going from not great to great is a possibility for everybody. Uh, I, I love that, right? It's, it is about the human, the human element. And it's so easy to get caught up in the, like the artifacts of like what you go and see. And that was some of the, the mm -hmm. trap, right? And like what some of the early researchers, you know, saw at these organizations and they were enablers and, you know, some right. of the different levels of the system, but the secret sauce, as Mr. Yoshino says, is an attitude towards learning and like, how do yeah. we engage people in that? Uh, so I'd love to dive into some of that and like the different levels of system and how you get to that level three, which is often the most invisible part, right? You know, the, right. The, the, the part that's hard to see, but it's actually the enabler, the management system, the leadership behaviors, the, the systems that support learning and the conditions for learning. So uh, maybe you could walk us through sort of those three layers and then really focus on that, that third layer and some of the ahas you had um, sure. in your research together. Gene, you want to give us a start there and I'll pick up? No, no, why don't you uh, go first? Oh, yeah, sure. So um, 
uh, starting at the end, we, we talk about these different layers and we talk about the third one being the social circuitry, the overlay of processing and procedure. So I'll explain how we got to that term and why. Um, again, what we've been saying all along, and, and it's, it's evident not only in this conversation, but everything the three of us have ever said, the people with whom we work closely have ever said, ever written, et cetera, is that um, the difference between great and not great is the ability of an organization to really tap in and, and uh, give full liberation to the ingenuity of the minds and the intellectual horsepower that's uh, distributed throughout the enterprise. And when we start thinking about the application of people using their minds, their ingenuity to solve hard problems, there, there are a couple of places where we naturally think people do that. So the first, and this is to this issue of layers that we discussed in the beginning of the book, is that um, we all tend to think about, oh, you know, that, that person, you know, he, she, wickedly clever in understanding the object in front of them, whether it's literal or figurative. And that object might be a gear, that object might be a gene, that object might be a piece of code, might be a concept. But the, the thing on the bench top. And we also appreciate that uh, as uh, much understanding and ingenuity and genius you have about that object, your ability to act on it is enabled by that ingenuity and that competency and capability, but it also depends on a second layer of capability and competency. And that's the, uh, the understanding of the sophisticated, sometimes very sophisticated, complicated instrumentation through which we act on that object. And again, just to go back to the literal examples, so if you have someone who's a you know, wicked genius about uh, a mechanical device like a gear or a gear set, the only way they can give expression to that understanding is they also have tremendous capability about um, using various types of tools, uh, material addition, material subtraction, forming, shaping, whatever else, heat treating, right? There's a lot of capability necessary there. Um, in the papers just the other day, there's a huge breakthrough in, the, in developing a treatment for sickle cell. I mean, it's enormous. It's enormous. It's a, it's, a, it's a terrible affliction on people. And there's a promise that it will not afflict anybody once this uh, treatment's in place. Is there anything about that? Layer one, huge understanding of the genetic code that causes sickle cell and the change in the code that um, would uh, remove this as an affliction about which we have to worry. And then there's the mastery of the CRISPR technology to actually edit the genes, all right? So that's layer one, layer two, uh, the object, the instrumentation. And then we get to layer three. And this is something that really uh, struck uh, Gene and me as we were writing the book, is I think we make a, a very simple assertion, which once you say it, it becomes self-evident, but I don't think we discuss it often um, as practitioners, is the whole reason we form organizations in the first place is to solve problems collaboratively that we can't even imagine addressing individually uh, and, and whatever else that happens. And in the book, we go with a lot of examples, but that's the key point, right? That we, we try, we're not putting our literal shoulders to the wheel together as, a, as an expression of brawn. It's that we're putting our minds onto the problem as an expression of collective brain. And this is where this layer three comes in, is that when we are ta tackling enormous, complex, unwieldy problems far greater in scale and scope that any of us individually could tackle, we need processes and procedures because that's the way we first get the division of labor. You do this, Gene does that, I do something else. And then make sure those pieces come together smoothly, harmoniously, um, integrated into a, a very nice collective action towards a common purpose. And it's that overlay of processes and procedures which allow this harmonious choreography, this uh, really uh, seamless integration which we call social circuitry. There's layer three, the, connect, the, the way we connect individual effort into this collective whole. I'll just add one point, which is, uh, you know, I love the, the term socio-technical systems. Mm -hmm. So layer three is the socio part of the socio-technical system. Right. And yeah. you know, leaders are ultimately responsible for creating the conditions so that people can do their work easily and well. And so when we talk about layer three, that is really about, you know, the architecture that people work within. That's right. Yep, absolutely. And, and just to highlight uh, this, the story that Mr. Yoshino shared with me and is in one of my book, the, the story I tell the most about like this paint mistake and, <sighs> you know, if listeners can go and, and read more about it. I, it's the one I like, open all my keynotes with, but the, the it, really the highlight is Mr. Yoshino made this mistake that required <laughs> over a hundred cars to have to be repainted. This is in his orientation program. <laughs> right. Not only did he not get yelled at or blamed for making this mistake, his managers thanked him for making the mistake. And they said, it's because 
thank you for highlighting that we didn't create the conditions for you to be successful at work. And that's our responsibility. Right. And, and he said that happened over and over again at Toyota. And, you know, this really speaks to like that real understanding and responsibility exactly of what you're describing of that, that level three circuitry of like the leader's responsibility to create those conditions and the structures yeah. that allow the thinking and the processes and, and the work to happen in a way that results in better outcomes and better problem solving. Yeah. Katie, if I could just pick up on that with a, a huge uh, ditto, hallelujah, amen, you know, that kind of thing um, is that uh, one of the things that I, I found so enormously encouraging over the many years I've been researching, writing and trying to bring, you know, channel ideas that geniuses have created and make them available to other people is um, the many of the geniuses that we know, sort of had this co-evolution towards this exactly the same conclusions. And um, we can be pretty certain that uh, several of the geniuses had no opportunity to even know of each other, let alone influence each other, yet they reached exactly the same conclusions. And the reason I bring that point up is um, I was a, a student, a, a mentee, and I'd say a friend of Paul O'Neill for the better part of two decades. He led Alcoa, we talk about it in the first book, The High Velocity Edge, about how he led this profound transformation from a very dangerous place, as you would expect, given the nature of the processes they work to um, create aluminum products and turn it into the safest employer in the country, along with the most productive, the most efficient. Everything was, you know, went from, you know, not great to great at everything. <laughs> and when Paul was asked, how he was able to lead such a profound transformation over such a sprawling enterprise. One of his answers was it depended on three questions. And this links back exactly to what you said. He said, look, what I did and what I taught um, our other leaders to do is just have three questions they were equipped with to ask everyone every day. And the first question was, when you arrived at work today, did you feel like you were prepared to succeed? And the second question was, um, when you did your work, did someone whose um, opinion you respect, did they make you feel appreciated for what you've done? And then the third question was, and when you were done with your work, when you went home, did you feel the act of doing that work added value to your own life? And Paul's point about all this, and it ties exactly back to your pain story with uh, Mr. Yoshino, was that um, answer an answer of no to any of those three had to be a trigger back to leaders that they somehow had failed to create the conditions in which someone else could show up and give fullest expression to their potential as a creative human being. Yeah, I, I love that. And I have to say, thank you for bringing those, those questions forward in your book. They were hugely impactful in the work I was doing at Stanford Children's Hospital at the time. And we brought some of those questions into the, the healthcare organization. And yep. you know, how, how do we start creating those conditions there as well? Uh, I want to highlight something else of this connection, this, you know, and it sort of builds off this concept of circuitry as well. You know, at, at Toyota, there's a process they call pull the end on, which is literally, you know, the, the light, well, it used to be a cord that people could pull if there was a problem yeah. on the line is now it's a light. And when, when I go to, when I go to Japan, when I go to Toyota and watch them, it's like the light is being signaled all the time. But where the circuitry co element comes in is, you know, a lot of people say, oh, we need to create an organization where people feel empowered to stop the line <laughs> or to highlight problems. And, and yeah, they, they do. That's one thing. But the important element is the manager or the leader's response to that right. request. It's like closing the circuit, closing the loop, because if you're just expecting people to, you know, oh, we need to, you know, make the problem visible. If we don't have that response by leaders, it it's in vain. And also when I like probably have the opposite reaction and people are like, why would I even do that? Yep. Uh, can you talk about some of your experience in that and sort of the, the importance of leadership response and, and mm -hmm. maybe that we can start diving into some of the, the sub elements of your subtitle. Cause I, this, you know, this puts, puts it into there around the, the slow, slowification, simplification and amplification elements. Yeah. Katie, that, that's great. I'll, Gene, I'll take a stab at this and then uh, shut up. Um, so, Katie, we, we talk in the book about um, creating conditions in which people can give full expression to their ingenuity, their cleverness, uh, let their minds be most creative. And we talk about how to move from a condition we call the danger zone, where it's really hard individually or collectively to solve problems, to what we call the winning zone, where it's much easier to solve problems. 
and we talk about three mechanisms. And um, you know, one slowification is to make problem solving easier. And then there's another one called simplification, to make the problems themselves easier. But then there's a third one, which is amplification. And amplification, the and on chord, is to make it much easier to make it obvious that you have a problem that needs attention and needs attention before the problem has an opportunity to become big. And um, in, the, in the case of Toyota, what we see is that they have been, and I, I talk about this, uh, whether it was the DNA article or the high velocity edge, this fastidiousness, this obsession about creating standards around things, whether it's the work of an individual that occurs in a one minute cycle time or a standard, a, a script, a choreography, about how to do the work of hundreds, if not thousands of people. And for the Toyota though, it's not enough just to have the script. What's also necessary is to have the test built into the script to call out early and often when the script is failing so that someone can come over quickly and say, oh, what's the problem? How can I help? And that question, what's the problem? How can I help? Has a, both a very immediate and a slightly longer um, response immediately What's the problem? How can I help contain the problem so it doesn't endure here and aggravate you further? But also, how do I help you contain the problem so it doesn't escape and become a systemic problem rather than a local one? But the other part, how can I help, is, all right, now that we've contained the problem, can we immediately start studying the problem and investigating the problem and, and, and really diving into the problem to understand what we can do to prevent its recurrence? And this, this, this is you know, right at the heart of the combination and on cord and the team leader who responds immediately to when the cord is pulled and the lights flash and the music starts and the group leader who responds. But this, this becomes, like, you know, again, to this co-evolution, every place we've looked that is great as opposed to not great, best versus not best, has some element of amplification as part of their core ethos, this um, sort of passionate obsession to make sure that whatever they're doing, they can see when they're doing it wrong very, very early before those problems have a chance to become big problems. Yeah, I'll add on to that. <clears throat> yeah, I think one of the things I'm really proud about the book is uh, uh, you know, Steve was insistent uh, that um, – um, uh, just so you know a little about Steve, uh, the, the word culture can be a little bit triggering for him. And you know, I think for, for good reasons, right? It's a, it's a bit gossamer. It's a bit uh, uh, ethereal. It's, it's defied easy explanation. And so what we did in the amplification section is, you know, we almost uh, did it from first principles. We can create a system where weak signals of failure can be you know, decisively acted upon, responded to, so that we can prevent issues, enable quicker detection and recovery. Or we can create a system where these weak signal of failures are ignored, suppressed, extinguished entirely. Right? Right. It does not good, straight good outcomes. And uh, we're using, um, you know, circuitry as a uh, as a metaphor uh, that you know uh, this, as, and we're using information theory to say, you know, signals must be generated, transmitted, received, acted upon, and uh, confirmed. And uh, you know that creates a. Uh, a very clear language about what are the necessary and sufficient conditions, you know, for, uh, you know, the right behaviors, the right signals and the norms that leaders must create within this layer three social, social circuitry. I'll give you a, a technology example that uh, is legend uh, in our space. Um, one of the people who really helped coin uh, DevOps as a term is John Alsbaum. So uh, in 2009, he gave this famous presentation saying that we're doing 10 deploys a day, every day at Flickr, the photo sharing site in 2009. When people heard this, people threw up in the aisles. It was so terrifying. So it sounded irresponsible, reckless, it sounded immoral, right? And the, like the notion of doing 60 line side changes per day in a manufacturing plant, it just seemed inconceivable. Um, and so he became the CTO at Etsy, the you know famous uh, uh, small crafts e-commerce site. And uh, he described the story of a uh, technical change that could never cause an outage. It's like a CSS change. It's like changing a font color. And most engineers would say that is a low risk change that cannot possibly take down the site. Uh, one day someone makes one of these CSS changes and it not only takes down the site, uh, it essentially figuratively like sets the data center on fire. The engineers all had to run to the data centers, manually power cycle the machines <laughs> multiple times because it caused, you know, some horrendous something to go wrong. Anyway, you know, they, 
uh, you know, hours later, they take a hard outage. Um, it was reported in CNBC and so forth. Uh, and they realize, okay, a CSS change can take down the entire site because of, you know, a confluence of, uh, you know, a lot of factors uh, that normally wouldn't happen. So what do they do about it? Um, they create this ritual called the Three Armed Sweater Award, where the engineer who made the biggest mistake would go on stage in the quarterly town hall and tell like what happened, <laughs> what they learned, <laughs> and it create it helped um, reinforce this culture that it was not only safe to make mistakes, but you share it widely. You know, maybe on the off chance that you might help another future engineer prevent a similar, you know, horrendous, you know, bad thing from happening again. I think that's another great thing about what leaders can do to amplify further amplify these type of signals that create the norms uh, and the layer three um, system so that people aren't afraid to make changes and don't hide them. Right. Or yeah, right. It, it, it's okay to make a mistake. I mean, we obviously want to prevent mistakes that are right. going to cause harm, but like, how do we learn from them? Uh, right. Certainly. And how do we do that on that, like that faster, that faster, um, smaller yeah. scale as well? You know, I was I've been thinking a lot about your 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 word slowification and I really love it because I find that so many of the barriers to at least I've been the leaders I work with they feel like they don't have time. We're stuck in this world that feels like everything's is five alarm fire, it must be happen happen urgently. And so like maybe I know as a leader I should ask more questions or pause, but we we gotta just keep doing, doing, doing. And so what were some of the things that uh well, first I'm curious about the word slowification and then two, like how does this like slowing down really help enable these winning organizations um, and high performance? Yeah, it's sort of like the opposite term? of yeah, a lot sure, of yeah. leaders think. Yeah. So it's, um, it did cause a, a bit of a concern that uh, we chose to make up a word and we put in the <laughs> subtitle of the book. Um, but, you know, we, it wasn't from lack of searching. Uh, you know, the word we were looking for is the notion of slow down, uh, temporarily to speed up in the long term, you know, a short term investment for a longer term gain, <laughs> stop sawing to sharpen the saw. It's like we have this concept in adages, but there's no word that actually describes right. it. And uh, you know, I think sometimes, uh, you know, maybe uh, I'll, I'll just say it. Uh, sometimes we believe that maybe the lack of a word actually inhibits management leaders from, um, you know, doing the right thing because they don't have a word for it. So we chose the word slow fi um, to. Uh, to, to embody that concept, you know, to pause uh, so that we can, you know, uh, the, the worst time to improve is in the middle of an outage in production like scenarios right. where you can't undo, <laughs> you can't experiment, uh, you know, um, and as Steve is fond of saying, you know, learning is inherently experimental. And so if uh, uh, those you can't do that, like when you're having an urgent problem. Yeah. And so uh, we have to do that better in planning uh, or in preparation. And, and so, uh, you know, my fondest hope is that, you know, by giving people a word saying, Hey, look, uh, uh, we are doing very tough problem solving in exactly the wrong time. <laughs> right? So we should slowify. Um, and in the technology space, uh, often it comes from this desire to ship features quickly, right. Crowding out, um, other important activities like, you know, planning, like preparation, like automation and so forth. And, um, I, I really do believe Steve that, you know, by giving people a word saying, Hey, look, uh, yeah. Do, do you think that slowification? You know, we should invest some time in slowification. You know, that's actually going to lead to uh, more conversations, Steve. Yeah, hundred percent. So, uh, Katie, the, the the theme we're trying to get is um, make the distinction danger zone to winning zone. The experience we've had where sometimes we're in a situation where we have to react in a very impulsive way. There's just no time to generate a new thought or even appreciate the situation. We just have to react, 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 react. And we know that unless we've already hardwired muscle memory exactly the right reaction to the situation, w w we could be done for. And um, it's kind of the visualization of this is in, in the movie The Matrix when Neo kind of really, you know, locks in. I don't know what he locks in. Luke locks into the force. Whatever it is that Neo's right. locking in, right? And, 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 and the bad guys have this enormous disadvantage because they're moving at what feels normal speed to them. But to Neo, everything is just slowed down. Now, Hollywood calls that that slowing down bullet time. Cool term, describes it cinemagraphically. Um, lousy term for a management book. <laughs> what we're trying to do is, is, is to describe, um, pick a word that describes this contrast and experience between where we know we're in a um, high stakes situation and we just feel like, oh, we don't have time to even catch our breath, let alone figure out our way to a good answer versus, oh, man, everything is just slowed down on us. 
And so we, we picked this word slowification to capture that element. Now, for what it's worth, um, the only time we can be ready to execute, particularly when performance is high stakes, high speed, unforgiving, is that we've actually allowed ourselves and the people for whom we're responsible to um, step back in planning and have plans that can be hole punched, um, have plans that can be um, uh, red teamed, war games, stress tested, et cetera. Actually practice, not for the purpose of practicing to um, master the plan, but in part, that's part of it, of course, but in part to find out what's wrong with the plan, we try to put it into play. So that way, when we actually go into play, we've already debugged the thinking. And so we're not carrying the bugs into the doing because we've left those long behind. Now, to your point about us feeling under pressure all the time is um, the irony is, is that when we have something to do, someone will always raise their hand and say, oh, Katie, well, you just have to understand that we don't have time to do this slowification and solve problems with the rigorous feedback and da 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 because we have to get this work done. Now, of course, what that means is that when we go to do the work, we're ill-prepared to succeed and uh, we're likely to fail. And what happens when we fail? Then we slow down and figure out why we failed. But of course, once we failed, all we have is like trash and scatter and, and, and uh, debris everywhere and ruined emotions and this and that. We, and we can't rebuild the thing. And, and we've done exactly the same thing, right? Which is um, we've uh, performed badly. And now we're doing the slow thinking to figure out uh, why we performed fa- badly and what we're going to do now. Now that we've performed badly, we have to deal with the debris. Where If all we did was take that same slow thinking and put it before the doing, <laughs> we'd succeed. Yeah. I mean, we're going to do it anyway. That, that, that's, that, that's like the, the, the hair pulling part of it. We're going to do the slow thinking. And the question is, are we going to do it as a, um, a, 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 a retrospective investigation of a catastrophe? Or are we going to do it as a prospective preparation for a major success? But either way, we're going to do it. So, no. Right. I mean, it's, it's just like we got to get ourselves out of that terrible, like vicious cycle right. of feeling like we don't have time because we're going to do it, but in the wrong way. This reminds <laughs> exactly. me of, I had a conversation uh, with an author named Eduardo Briseño who works with uh, Carol Dweck about what he calls the the performance paradox. And like the same thing we got caught in this performance zone where we're not in what he calls the learning zone. And like, that's where like the improvement happens. So, so we also get, we feel like we always have to be performing and so that right. actually, if, if I link it to what your, your concept of the winning zone and, and the danger zone, if we're always feeling like we have to be in high performance, we actually are trapping ourselves in or like falling into the danger zone because we, we, we're, not, we're not learning, improving, slowing down. Yeah, yeah, uh, we're diving into the black hole. Yeah, Can I totally. Give an example? From the tech yes, space please. That, you know, we yeah. were just uh, so inspired by. And, and this has been what was so rewarding working with Steve was, uh, uh, you know, you take these things that these stories that I thought I understood. And then I tried to explain it to Steve. He's like, I don't get it. That's impossible. <laughs> it just forced me to, to really tease out what are the necessary and sufficient um, mechanisms that must be there. So in this case, it's Google. Uh, mm-hmm. And one of the things that they had to figure out is, you know, how do they survive uh, major uh, natural disasters so that uh, Google doesn't go down? Um, and so what they found, uh, they had these things called the disaster recovery um, uh, drills. And uh, what they found was that, um, you know, they were going through the motions, uh, simulating uh, disasters, but there was this uh, uh, pattern that they were relying on sort of key individuals and knowledge that wasn't in their heads. And uh, you know, if that person was out sick, right, they couldn't actually do the uh, uh, disaster recovery. And so they uh, started this program called the DIRT program, Disaster Incident Response Team, <laughs> that was specifically around red teaming these exercises. And they uh, did these increasingly audacious drills where, um, you know, they would simulate, you know, a uh, earthquake in Northern California. Uh, they would simulate, um, but to simulate this key personnel issue, they would have, uh, they would uh, simulate aliens invading the city and abducting the key personnel. So like they are, <laughs> cannot participate in the exercise. You must rely on things they already wrote down. And so this exposed uh, these vulnerabilities, these latent um, uh, defects that, uh, uh, so they could fix it in a planned way, you know, in a drill, as of, as opposed to, you know, uh, when real disaster strikes. And so it's these uh, kind of amazing stories of like incredible uh, production-like simulations that, you know, really separate, you know, the best from the not best or the, the first from the worst. Yeah. 
Totally. I've I've been reflecting back, Steve, on your comment about like the <laughs> that was the bullet, uh, you know, from Neo. What uh, just like a bad phrase of applying to management systems. And I was thinking back to a time when Jim Womack had said something similar that instead of choosing the word lean, they had almost decided to call their observation of the Toyota production system the fragile system. But again, what <laughs> what kind of man, what kind of leader wants to implement something called fragile? Right. So you know, but I don't know if lean's any any better um, in the way it's uh, represented. Well, to, you know, a quick uh, reference to Gene's point about giving people the, the terminology. And again, I, I guess the encouragement there is with anything, you know, that we as people trying to capture good thoughts, express them out, is encourage the readers to actually read the definitions we gave to the words. Because yes. lean um, was uh, the definition of an outcome, the ability to do so much more with so much less. Uh, when John Krafsik wrote his seminal 1988 paper about the emergence of lean production um, in a Sloan management review, his whole point was on any given day, there was this handful of great plants that with half the people, half the space, half the inventory, half the capital equipment, half, 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 had twice the output, and it was much, much better. And he was trying to contrast this ability to do so much more with so much less, and he called it lean because he was looking for a, a good contrast with the term mass production. So I said, well, if that's mass production, then this is lean. But what, what, what's happened? And this is the Gene, I think, Gene, you made a point. It's, it's good to give people words, but it's also incumbent on them to <laughs> take the word and import mm -hmm. with it the functional definition. So in the case of lean, lean was um, all the practices inside that allowed you to have half in and infinite out compared to everybody else. But what happened with lean is that people misused the word. And thought that, oh, lean was not half the people, half the space as a consequence of our management practices. They thought that was actually the independent variable. Oh, well, if we want to be lean like Toyota, get rid of the inventory, get rid of that. And, and we've seen the same um, bastardization of terms like re-engineering back to hammer and champion, on and on and on, agile. And so anyway, I just want to say it's, yeah. it's, it's very useful to have words uh, and terms. But again, it's incumbent on the user to know what the definition is and not use some bastardized version of it. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, I, one of the things I also really appreciate about your book and your collaboration together, Steve and Jean, is that you're you're bringing it back to the principles, you know, that tra they go across and you have some nice diagrams in the book, too, that so the interrelationship between uh, what we might call lean and agile and DevOps and all these other sort of, you know, things that have a, a name to it and sometimes can get seen as something other than just <laughs> great management practices that are getting right. back to what, you know, these the the circuitry of how do we create the conditions for high performance to thrive. Yep. So, yeah. I can't mention maybe one part of what it was yeah. like working with Steve and Steve, I haven't I told know. you this, but uh, yeah, I was, I was trying to describe, uh, you know, what it was like to work with someone who came from a totally different, um, you know, field of study and uh, field of experience. And so I, I came from, uh, you know, software all my life. Um, Steve started off in manufacturing, you know, then, you know, engine design, safety culture at Ocala and so forth. But what was so interesting, but he also has a background in economics. And I felt like, you know, the, the, so many times, you know, for us to be able to find a term, we, you know, we access that heavily, right? I learned about the value of creating independence of action, uh, you know, creating, uh, you know, optionality, uh, you know, it, it gave, uh, uh, it said that these aren't just good ideas. A, this is actually, you know, uh, we can say exactly why these are good ideas. The other thing that I thought was remarkable is that so much of our um, reading list was the same. <laughs> so that uh, we could, if, you know, the, if you have a Venn diagram of uh, the literature view of all books and papers re <laughs> read, there's right. actually a significant amount of overlap. And I can't tell you just how useful that was over the last decade to be mm. able to start converging on, oh, these things are not just similar, they are actually the same. Yes. Um, and so uh, I thought it was, I think, if I could wave a magic wand, I'm hoping that what this book will do is establish from first principles, you know, what are the three mechanisms of performance and understand, you know, what are similar, <laughs> which are the same, which are genuinely complementary, um, and uh, deduce from uh, first mm -hmm. principles, like what the extremes are. And, and I'm hoping it will not just be a book for DevOps people or lean Toyota production system people or yep. resilience engineering people that, you know, they say, oh, this is a book that explains all of the things that we're familiar with. Yeah. Yeah. Steve, what's something you learned uh, 
through the process of writing the book, Jean just shared something like you got to be got more clarity on or, or learned through the actual writing and collaboration process. Yes, yeah, so I'll return the favor to Jean. One of the things I learned about Jean is that there are probably very few more curious people than Jean. <laughs> uh, with, with just an, an incredible uh, happy energy to ask people questions and learn from them and not carry ego into the conversation. But like, oh, I'm Jean Kim. And so, you know, I'm doing you a favor. It's just, no, no, okay, just I'm going to listen and ask some very informed questions about what you do so I can understand better. So that was huge. Um, one, one of the things that I, I said this to Gene many years ago is that um, his behavior is atypical. And, and Katie, you and I know it, and I think all your listeners and readers know this, is that very often someone becomes uh, known for something, whatever that something is. And um, they use that to turn a spotlight on themselves and try and continually draw attention to themselves as the guru of that thing. And to Gene's credit, by being um, happily curious about what other people know, he's made it, um, I think, just natural, but I think also deliberate to always turn the spotlight away and never make it about himself. So when you go to one of his conferences, if you have it, I encourage you to do, Gene is up there and he's the, the master of ceremonies, but it's never about Gene. It's about all the people he's brought together to share their understanding. And so it, that was, it makes Gene a rather unusual personality to begin with, but also it's a very good lesson about how we should approach the world and spend more time turning the spotlight away from ourselves and onto other people so we can see what they're doing. That's uh, that's certainly huge. Um, at one of these conferences, Gene and I had a chance to wrap up and say, well, what did you learn from writing the book? <laughs> and uh, my conclusion, and I'll, I'll sum, you know, shorten it here, was that um, whatever we do, come back to the individual. And, and, and it's in two directions, both the individual and the, how the individual collects to things larger than themselves, but also focus on the individual so they can. We, we start the book with um, just a, a narrative, which is uh, the day that the Apollo 11 crew started leaving lunar orbit to descend to the moon. There was something like 650 million people simultaneously watching that daring adventure. And for those young people, there was no internet. I mean, people had to actually be in front of a TV to watch this. But not only was it the 650 million people, is that they where, where and how did they do it? They, they, they did it at train stations, at airports, in parks, in town squares. And why is that? Because we all have this um, intense need to connect to something much bigger than ourselves and say, yes, I was there and I was part of it. So that's part of the individual. And are, are we creating conditions in which someone every day can say, I was part of something much bigger than myself? But then it comes back to the, in the other direction, which is as a leader, if you want to um, do the pulse check on your organization, you don't have to do these massive surveys and studies and generate all these datas and metrics and reports and have briefings and presentations. Just go to the place of work and, and yeah. watch someone. Just, you know, turn the spotlight on them and just respectfully watch their experience and ask yourself the question, the Paul O'Neill question, the person I'm watching, have we created conditions in which he or she is prepared to succeed? And if not, you know, that's a warning that the, probably that's true for everywhere else in the organization. So uh, anyway, the big takeaway is, as individuals, we want to be connected to a much larger whole. And as leaders, the way we do that is, again, focus on the individual and make sure that we've actually prepared individual by individual to have that opportunity. Can I add one more thing just to sort of uh, riff on the magnificence of the uh, Apollo <laughs> landing story? What blew me away um, as we were researching this book was that how young the people were. <laughs> the, the, uh, you know, for the 600, you know, for those hundreds of millions of people to watch, uh, Scores of people had to go out and set up a satellite network <laughs> or whatever, uh, you know, a, a communication yeah. network, you know, so that they, to even do that. These were 20 year olds. The people in mission control were 20 and 30 year olds. <laughs> Gene yeah. Kranz was in his 30s. I mean, it's just to see what they achieved with such a young group of people uh, who are just as, uh, you know, I guess there were no veterans of moon landings, right? <laughs> but I mean, it's just, it just uh, further amplifies just the momentous uh, incredibleness of, of those achievements. Um, right. And, and so clearly yeah. the, the layer three brought out the best yeah. uh, yes. of everyone in that yeah. system. 
Yeah, and so strongly connected to a common purpose, as uh, you've you've been sharing here. Like, we be inspired by that common purpose, or you know, as Mr. Yoshino says in my book, like set that direction. Like, we, so where are we going? You know, Steve, I was, as you're talking, I was reflecting on how in one of my recent Japan study trips, actually the same company that has this hundred year calendar that I have behind me, someone asked him, the, the leader, the, the executive saying, well, what, what kind of surveys do you have about your employee engagement? And like, how, how do you measure that? Because <laughs> they, they say that their company, company purpose is to create happiness. So our purpose is happiness. Like, well, how do you measure happiness? How do you know? And he's like, what do you, what do you mean? What surveys do I have? I mean, I, he's like, I, I go out. And I see, I go engage with my people. That's how I know if they're happy. It's like, do you take a survey to your family? You know, you, you interact with them every day. And that's like, you know, so yes, yeah, sometimes we need to have the data, but it's really about going to see, go to Gemba, go actually interact. Um, I want to ask you both just one personal question and then uh, we'll wind up. I mean, there's so much we could keep talking on. And that's great advice, Steve, too, that you were having about what leaders can do or what continuous improvement practitioners can do. But I want to know from each of you, what is one thing that you've had to really change or adjust in yourselves as leaders to become more effective in wiring a winning organization or a winning team? Like what's something that you, a behavior that's really been a shift that you've made over time? Steve, um, I can go first. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, I think there's kind of two behaviors that I have had the privilege to observe um, and uh, had to overcome <laughs> myself, and they seem like mutually contradictory. Uh, but if I think they are absolutely uh, both necessary. Uh, one is, uh, you know, the uh, total comfort in being able to say, "I don't know," <laughs> and uh, and I remember uh, this is in my last days of Tripwire. Uh, I'm in a room full of lawyers. Um, I have one little friend and a speakerphone on the box, and I they're using everyone's using words I don't understand, <laughs> right? And uh, I feel so intimidated when I realize all, this whole meeting is is for me for for me to like create an exit, and I'm actually the most important person in the room. And I could have actually said, "I have no idea." If I could replay that meeting in my head, <laughs> right? I do that many times. Is I could have said. And I should have said, I have no idea what you guys are talking about. And I don't think your goal is to you know, bamboozle me and confuse me to make me make a wrong decision. Can you just help me understand, you know, using uh, terms that a five-year-old, no, sorry, a fifth grader could understand. Uh, you know, I think um, that uh, feeling of uh, being able to say, hey, I am not tracking anything of what's going on, but I think it's important. <laughs> and uh, me asking you questions is my way of saying I care about the outcomes. I think that's a behavior that uh, I got to model. And uh, Steve, you and I have hung out with many people who have this incredible ability to, to, to say those very vulnerable things like, I have no idea, I don't understand. Um, right. That, that's one. And then the, also, like, I think the notion of uh, uh, that firmness of uh, as an architect of a system, right? The leader also has to have high standards, you know, high energy, high standards, you know, great in the large, but also they love walking the floor. They love getting the details because those are the, uh, it's only by doing that you can be sufficiently plugged in to know what signals need to be amplified, <laughs> yeah. what are hardships that people are having that, uh, you know, as a leader, you know, only you uh, are uniquely, it is your job to fix those issues. And so uh, as uh, Mr. Yoshina says, it's not about being nice. It's about having the energy and the, having the high standards, you know, to, mm. um, uh, to expect greatness and right. Yeah. That are conditions that create greatness. How am yeah. I doing Steve? hundred uh, percent. I think what That's I'm going to say is ditto just in different words is, um, you know, Katie, the question of what I had to change um, personally, I think it's the personaliza personalization of amplification. Um, in one case is uh, be more and more willing to uh, say, this is the best I got. Tell me what's wrong and do that earlier and more often than I would have ever thought. Um, I, you know, I talked to my kids about this when I was writing a, a thesis in college I said, I'm going to go and get do all my work and bang away at it. And, you know, by the time I saw my advisor, it was probably December. And he looked at it and he said, wow, you've done a lot of work. None of it useful, but it, the volume is enormous. <laughs> and um, I ended up with a C on that thesis because I just simply didn't have the recovery time. And a as I've gone through uh, my career, um, I hope, and again, I'm not consistent on this, uh, but I hope what I do is, do this, the equivalent of the sketch, the draft, et cetera, and say, all right, this is what I got. What's wrong? All right, here's version two, version three, version 12. And 
only stop when someone is not that they say it's right, but they can't tell me anymore what's wrong. <laughs> so th th that's one part. But I think the other part is that when you start um, doing this amplification for oneself, um, you become a much nicer person to be around. One, because your arrogance has to go way down. But the other part is that you become much more appreciative of the effort other people are making on their way to their best effort, which may be in the, because it's the first best effort may be riddled with flaws. So yeah, I guess um, the short answer is, uh, you know, what's the, uh, I guess, maturation um, is the personalization of amplification as a way to uh, act and treat. Mm, those are great words, but from both of you of your personal learnings about how to lead with greater uh, greater impact to really create these why and why are these winning organizations? So, mm -hmm. so much richness of your knowledge. Oh, Gene wants to say something more, well, please. We would be remiss if we didn't get yours, Kate. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, great. Well, thanks for turning the tables on me. You know, I talk about this often, but I've had to learn how to break the telling habit. That's what I like to say. I like to say I'm, I'm my name is Katie Anderson, and I have a telling habit. Um, it, you know, I my enthusiasm uh, to contribute and to help, as well as my enjoyment of solving problems, can get in my way. So it can be great as an independent contributor. And you know, I told you I was trained as an ac as an academic, and then like I was asked to get the answer. But when I moved into continuous improvement, um, consulting, coaching roles, and then as a leader and manager me having all the answers all the time actually wasn't my job um, <laughs> sometimes, but like it was to create, as you just said, it was to create the yeah. conditions for other people to have their answer. And I had this horrifying like situation about 11 years ago where my coach uh, came to me and she was following me for the day. And, you know, she said, she said it was like, I was like the, the lion, you know, in the, <laughs> like <laughs> overtaking my team where I was like jumping <laughs> in and, you know, I was, I was like, I was interrupting them. And, you know, that's the last thing I wanted, right? That's not the impact I wanted, but it was my, you know, my high energy and my desire to contribute my ideas was actually getting in the way of my impact. And so I have to work each and every other, not every other day, each and every day, <laughs> every single day, every single minute to really, right. to practice slowification, to slow down. So I'm more intentional about how I'm showing up because I, it's so easy to get caught in that, just that doing or that, that, that trap. So really to slow down, to ask more questions, as you said, and to know it's not always my space to have the answer. And there is times for me to have the answer, but um, to right. create, create our awareness for that. So break the telling habits, mine. I love it. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Good. I'm well, thank you both. Telling habit. That's great. Yeah, it's you know, it's it comes from a good place of like genuine caring, but an overexpression, right? Right, right, right. <laughs> That's like the our Achilles heel is always like the overexpression of a you know a positive quality. Yeah. Uh, Gene Kim and Steve Spear, thank you so much for being here on Chain of Learning today. Uh, I'm. It's been a fabulous conversation, and I've learned so much from both of you. Uh, here and in the past. And I look forward to having, uh, continuing to strengthen and develop mm -hmm. this chain of learning and, and to the grow and learn together and, and to connect. And I, I really encourage everyone to read Wiring the Winning Organization. There's so much uh, richness of knowledge in there for anyone who's, you know, regardless of what discipline you're in or industry you're in, it's about how you create the human conditions that create success and impact and, uh, and the win. So <laughs> thank you again uh, for being here and we'll uh, see you next time. Thank you so much, Katie. And Katie, great seeing you, Steve. Us. Gene, yeah. we'll see you.